and welcome to What's Up with Dr. A. Nathan Young. I'm really, really excited. And the reason why is because everywhere I go, you guys are telling me how much this ministry is blessing you. I want you to know that I really appreciate hearing the feedback. We had no idea when we started this how God was going to use it in the lives of people all across the region. All we knew was that God had given us a vision and we were following his plan for this ministry. We love to hear your feedback. So when you get a chance, drop us a card in the mail letting us know what this ministry is doing in your life. Or you can go to myfaithbible.org and you can click on the contact us link and send us an email letting us know what God's doing in your life through this ministry. While you're there, don't forget that the way we sustain this ministry is through your support. So click on the giving tab, go to TV ministry and support this vital ministry. You can also mail your support in to 1148 North Columbia Street, Covington, Louisiana, 70433. For right now, let's go into our 1045 service at our Covington campus. And I know that God's going to meet you there and you're going to be blessed as a result of it. So I'll see you in 26 minutes. This is our third week in a series on worship, man. And uh, I'm just excited about it. I'm excited about what God's been doing in this series. Last week, we talked about how we worship God with awe. And we said that worshiping God with awe meant that we worship God with respect. In other words, we put some respect on his name. Amen. You don't just approach God any old kind of way. When we worship him, we worship him with respect like he is God. We've also established that worship is a response. It's me responding to who God is. So it's a response for me. And we said that our worship should reflect the fact that we are responding to who God is. So worship is a response and we worship God with awe. And then today what I want to establish is that not only do we worship God with awe, but we also worship God with abandon. 2 Samuel chapter 6 tells the story of David. And David, if you don't know who he was, he was the second king of the nation Israel who were God's chosen people. And if there were an example of what a worshiper is, of what a worshiper should be, David was the ultimate example that we find in the Bible. And the reason why is because David was a worshiper. Matter of fact, he was such a worshiper that the Bible says that he was a man after God's own heart. David so loved worship that many of the psalms that we read in the book of Psalms are actually psalms that were written by David as he was worshiping. And so he is the ultimate worshiper. If I had to pick out a hero for worship, it would be David. Well, right after David became king of Israel, David was so in love with God and the things of God that he decided that he was going to go and recover what was called the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if you don't know what the Ark of the Covenant is, this was a box that was about three feet long by two feet wide and two feet high. But it wasn't just a box. It was a box that God had told the children of Israel to build. And he didn't just tell them to build it any old kind of way. This box was plated in gold and it had cherubims on the outsides of it and they were gold. And it had rings around the outside at the lower parts of it and they were pure gold. And the reason why it had those rings is because some gold plated poles had to go through them because God said that this box was so holy that people were not to touch it. And so the only people who could carry it were the Levitical priests, and they were instructed to carry it by those poles. Inside of this box, God told them to put three things. Number one, he told them to put manna in a jar from when they were walking through the desert and God fed them with manna. He told them to put the Ten Commandments that he told wrote Moses to write. And he also told them to put Aaron's staff inside of this ark. Well, lo and behold, 
the thing that would happen is the ark represented and was the presence of God amongst the children of Israel. So whenever they went into a battle and they had the Ark of the Covenant with them, they were victorious in that battle. Whenever they had the Ark at the center of their nation, their nation experienced prosperity and they were doing good and abundance and things like that and everything was going good. Well, they got in trouble with God and God allowed the Philistines to run in and to take them captive and take the ark. Well, the Philistines, the ark to them was no good. And the reason why was because they were not the people of God. And so as long as the Philistines had the ark, they were actually cursed. They were so cursed that they decided we got to get rid of whatever this thing is. And they got rid of it and sent it back. They said, send that back (laughs) wherever it came from. We don't want no parts of it. So watch this. Israel gets a hold of it again, but it's not yet at the center of Israel, which was Jerusalem. And so it's kind of somewhere hidden away. When David becomes king after King Saul, right, David decides, you know what? The first thing I got to do is I got to go get the ark. The reason why David was so consumed with going to get the ark is because David recognized what Saul, who was the king before him, didn't recognize, and that is that the power and the presence of God was in the ark. And he knew that if he had the presence of God in Israel, then Israel would have everything that it needed. Listen, listen, listen. You know why some of us are not worshiping? us, why some of us can't bring ourselves to worship, it's because unlike David, you have not yet realized the value of the presence of God in your life. Listen, for many of us, we're looking for the provision of God. We want the protection of God. We desire the power of God. And God says, what you're missing is my power, my provision, my protection comes with my presence. And if you would just busy yourself making it a habit to get in my presence, you would experience my power like never before. You would experience my provision like never before. You would experience my protection like never before. But the problem for many of us is we want the provision and not the presence. We want the protection and not the presence. We want the power, but I ain't interested in being in the presence. That's why I'm so impressed with this crowd. Look around. Y'all look around. Y'all see all these Negroes and white folks? (laughs) And other folks, <laughs> you know what I said? I can't even lie. You're a pastor. You know what I said? I said, man, I looked online last night at NOLA.com, and I saw the parades in Slidell started rolling this weekend, and they was going to have one today and here and there. I said, and then I saw some of y'all out there at the Mardi Gras balls. Then the fellas. Guess what I said? I said, it's going to be light tomorrow. But I'm so proud of y'all. You know why? Because you came anyway. And the reason why that makes me proud is because it lets me know that you recognize the importance of getting yourself in the presence of God. It it, it lets me know why why is that important, Pastor? Here's why it's important. Not that there's anything wrong with a parade or a Mardi Gras ball. Look, don't be surprised if you see me at one, all right? And don't get in my way when I'm trying to do the two-step. I'm just saying. But but you you know why it impresses me? The reason why is because you recognize that the parade can't give me any power. The parade can't give me any provision. The parade can't give me any protection. And so although I do those things, the first thing I better make sure that I do at the top of the week is get in God's presence. Because I recognize that if I get in God's presence, well, then I'll have everything that I want, that I need. The presence of God, it's important. David drug the ark back, and, but he had some problems along the way. They, first of all, carried the ark on a cart. 
And God had told them that the Levitical priests were the ones who were supposed to carry the ark. Well, they hitched it to some oxen and carried it on the cart. And when they were carrying it, the Bible says that the Ark of the Covenant went sideways like it was going to fall. A guy named Uzzah reached out and held it up. He was trying to do a good thing, but he was disobedient to what God said. And God struck him dead right there on the spot. David got an attitude. The Bible says he got mad because God struck Uzzah dead. And David decided, well, I'm not going to take it to Jerusalem. I'm going to leave the ark in the house of a guy named Obed-Edom. He left it in Obed-Edom's house. And the Bible says that for three months while the ark was in Obed-Edom's house, God's favor was upon all of Obed-Edom's house. David caught wind that God's favor was upon Obed-Edom's house. And he said, I better rethink whether or not I'm mad about this whole ark thing. And he went and he got the ark. But this time he changed his style. He didn't put it on the ark. He did it like God said. He got the Levitical priest to carry it by the poles. And so that he showed proper respect to God, what David and the children of Israel did was they would take six steps and then they would stop and make a sacrifice to God and then take six steps and stop and make a sacrifice to God. Get this. They did that for 70 miles. Wow. Talk about all. Yeah, right. So when they finally got back to Jerusalem with the ark, David was excited. When they got back, there was 30,000 people from the children of Israel. And this is what's going on. David danced before who? The Lord. How? With all his what? Right. He wasn't just dancing, y'all. See, some of y'all at the Mardi Gras ball, y'all just dancing. <laughs> That's not how David was dancing. The Bible says, y'all, you know how y'all be. Y'all got to look cute. When y'all dance, I be seeing some of y'all, y'all. <laughs> then you looking at yourself. <laughs> Your partner try to get too close, you be. <laughs> that wasn't how David was dancing. This wasn't a cute dance. The Bible says that David danced with all of his what? <laughs> <laughs> but he was dancing with all of his what? Right. All of his might. He was wearing a priestly garment. So David and all the people of Israel brought the ark, ark of the Lord with shouts of what? Joy. So he's dancing and they're what? They're shouting. Shouts of what? Joy. Joy and blowing of the ram's horns. Now watch this. I want to skip. Watch what happens. Give me verse 20. I want you to see this. When David returned home to bless his own family, Michael, who is Michael? That's his wife. The daughter of Saul came to meet him. Watch this. She said in disgust. She had an attitude. He all happy. Don't you just hate when that happened? You happy? You got joy? And then you walk in the house and she got an attitude. He got an attitude. I had a good day at work. Not in my house. Everything's peachy. When I get home, Joyce meets me at the door. Hello, hero. <laughs> Fellas, don't hate on me. Find out what I'm doing. <laughs> She come out to meet him and she got an attitude. The Bible says she said, in what? In disgust. How distinguished the king of Israel looked today. Shamelessly exposing himself to the servant girls like any vulgar person might do. First of all, he wasn't exposing himself. He wasn't naked. She was exaggerating. How you know? Because when you go back to, I think it's verse 15 that we just read, it says that he had on a priestly garment. So she was exaggerating. Second of all, she's hating. This is my question, Michael. 
30,000 people singing and dancing and shouting to the Lord. And you got time to look at what David doing. <laughs> Can I tell you something? You know why many of us don't worship in the house of God? Because we got the Michael syndrome. We too busy looking at what other folk doing around us. We too worried about what other folk doing around us. And look, if you wasn't so worried about other people, then you could probably give God the worship and the praise that he's due. Here's my question for you. Are you David or are you Michael? What's the difference, Pastor? David danced before the Lord and had an audience of one. Michael stood still because she had an audience of 30,000. David was only concerned with what God said about him. Michael was concerned with what everybody else had to say about him. Watch this. Michael looked around and she found something to criticize. David looked up and he found a good God. Are you David or are you Michael? In other words, when you come into the house of the Lord, are you looking around or are you looking up? Are you worried about what other folks think about you or are you worried about what God got to say about you? Who's your audience when you worship? I got to tell you, my audience is God. Why? Because I don't gather for you. I don't come here for you. So when I come into the presence of the Lord, I'm going to lift my hands. I'm going to raise my voice. I'm going to tell him thank you. And if I look like a fool to you, good. I ain't doing it for you anyway. I'm doing it for the God I serve. Criticize me if you want. Really don't care. It's not for you. It's for God. Watch, watch, watch what David says to her. She clowning him. Watch, watch what he said. David retorted to Michael, I was dancing before who? I wasn't dancing for you. He says, the Lord who chose me above your what? Who was her father? Her father was the last king. And because he wasn't concerned with the things of God, God took him off the throne and put David on the throne. And what David was saying, I think that was really like a little. <laughs> I was dancing before God who picked me above your pappy. <laughs> I ain't said that's. You look that up in Hebrew and say your pappy. I'm just kidding. Don't go look that up. They don't say that. <laughs> Watch this. And he appointed me. I want you to get what David's saying. When he says, appointed me, what David was saying was, I can imagine David looking back and going, there was no reason why God should have picked me to be the king of Israel. David was saying, I was just a little shepherd boy out in the fields of nowhere, guarding and tending my father's sheep. As a matter of fact, not only was I insignificant in the world, but I was insignificant in my own family. So much so to the point where when the prophet came to anoint the next king, they didn't even invite me in. He had to tell them to go get me. So my own family didn't even count me as significant. So the fact that God picked me as the king. No, you're not my audience. God has elevated me to a position that I did not deserve. He's elevated me to a place that I did not qualify for. Oh, that gets me excited. You know why? Because here I am, Dr. A. Nathan Young, the pastor. Do y'all know me? The pastor? Every Sunday, I get a David complex. Because I pull up and I say, Lord, they showed up again. They must not know who I am. 
They can't know who you pick because if anybody don't deserve to be called yours, much less to be speaking on your behalf, it's me. Why? Because I'm nobody. I'm nothing. But for whatever reason, God picked me. And I'm looking at some people. You're in a position you don't deserve to be in. Watch this. Your family shouldn't be as blessed as it is. <laughs> Your kids shouldn't be that healthy. You shouldn't be that healthy. Come on now. I was teasing Joyce the other day. Yesterday. Because she take blood pressure medicine. The crazy part about it, she get mad at me every time. Because the crazy part about her taking blood pressure medicine is she eat healthy. I call home, what you got for dinner? Oh, I have some chopped cucumbers and squash with a little zucchini saute and some olive oil. May I take your order? <laughs> Give me a bacon double cheeseburger with the curly fries. King size it. <laughs> and I'm on a diet, so give me a medium Sprite. <laughs> it's undeserved favor. Not because I'm doing everything well. Right. Watch this. Watch what happens. He says, so I celebrate before who? The Lord. Watch this. And watch what he says. He said, yes. And I'm willing to look even more foolish than this. He, then he says this. He says, even to be humiliated in my own eyes. He says, I, you, you, think, you think I look bad to you? He says, I, for the God I serve, I'm willing to look bad to me. I, I'm willing to, to, to worship God to the point where I look back at me and say, boy, you look ridiculous. Watch this. I'll be seeing how some of y'all look at me when I get up here and sing. Y'all think I don't see it? Some of y'all be laughing. Here he go again. No, he can't sing. But guess what? I don't care. Why? Because I ain't here for you. I, I, you look, you can't bless me. You can't protect me. You can't keep me. You can't watch over me. And if you just had a glimpse of where God's brought me from, you would understand why I don't care. Because the God I serve has been too good to me for me to be quiet, for me to say nothing. And he said, make a joyful noise. All ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made me and not me myself. I am his people. I'm the sheep of his pasture. I'm going into his gates. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Because he's good. He's good. He's good. He's been better to me than I've been to myself. His mercy is everlasting. And His truth endures to all generations. Are you David? Or are you Michael? Stand to your feet. We're going to do something different. Watch these passages in song. This is David. He tells us how to worship. Psalms 27 4. He says, One thing I've asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my work. Why? To behold his beauty, to meditate in his temple. One of the things we do when we worship is we meditate. What is that? We think about who God's been to us. We think about how beautiful it is to be connected to a God who's that good. Watch, verse, watch Psalms 33. This is what he says. What's that first word? Seek. 
we meditate and we sing. We don't sing for depression. He says sing for joy. See, a lot of times you can sing your way out of a bad mood. You can sing your way out of trouble. You, you, you can sing your way right out of an unhappy, empty place into the presence of the Lord. Watch this, all oh, you righteous ones. Why? Because praise is becoming to the upright. Watch verse 2. He says, we give what? Thanks, Thanks to the Lord. With the lyre, sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new word. Pray skillfully with a shout of what? Joy. joy. Come let us worship. So we meditate on God's goodness. We sing for joy. Watch this. Let us worship and what? Bow down. Bow down. We bow down to the Lord. Why? Because he's God. Let us kneel, he said, before the Lord our maker, for he is our what? And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if we would hear his voice, one more thing, Psalm 141. So we meditate, we sing. Here's the other thing he said, may my prayer be counted as incense before you. We meditate, we sing, we pray. We pray. How do we pray? We pray and we tell God, thank you. We pray and we tell God what's on our heart. In the middle of worship, pastor, right in the middle of worship. Watch this. Not only do we pray, but we lift up our hands. What is the lifting of my hands, pastor? It's two things. It's a sign of victory. Victory. How, how is it a sign of victory, pastor? Here's the reason why. When your baby scored a touchdown. Come on, somebody. Or slam dunk the ball. What do you do? Come on now. I, I never saw a mama go like this. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I never saw a daddy say, yeah, boy. We say, yes. That's awesome. We lift our hands in victory. Here's the other thing that it is, though. It's surrender. How's that, pastor? Because somebody walk up to you to rob you. Tell you, put your hands up. What you going to do? Somebody say, I'm going to run. I'm going to run with my hands up. <laughs> Look, what is this? What are you telling them when you put your hands up? You ain't going to get no fight out of me. I give up. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. When we put our hands up to God, it's victory, but it's also us saying what? You ain't going to get no fight out of me, Lord. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. It says, and bless the world. The Lord. I want to offer you the opportunity to accept God's gift of salvation. How do I do it, Pastor Nate? You simply repeat this prayer after me. You bow your head and close your eyes right where you are. And you say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your gift of salvation. And today, I'm accepting you as my Lord and Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again. And I'm asking you to come into my life. It's in your son Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God bless you. We'll see you next time.